This episode is brought to you by the Redline Report by Brand Jitsu. What story is your website telling and how is it telling it? Are you just talking about yourself or are you connecting with your customers on a more meaningful level? Find out at brandjitsu.com slash redline. If you feel so inclined, you can support the show by like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcast. Also, you can go to patreon.com slash rebel rebel pod. The Rebel Rebel is a show dedicated to creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. It's for those people who think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. In this episode, you'll meet Lou Maxon, a creative powerhouse, super nice guy, and someone who loves to explore the intersections of creativity, innovation, and storytelling. His studio space just so happens to be a custom-built railway car nestled in the forests of Washington State. Discover how his unique journey in unconventional workspace fuels his passion for design and branding. Oh, the video for this episode was lost to the digital tech gods, so in its place I offer you the backdrop of my motorcycle trip from Ottawa, Ontario last summer. In full color, welcome to The Rebel Rebel. Somewhere across the world, in a train car, possibly in the United States, uh, Pacific Northwest, I'm not sure. I've got Lou Maxon. Lou, how the heck are you? I'm doing good. Made it to the afternoon, so we're going to call that a win. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. So just just so that people can, you know, don't geolocate you specifically, but what, what part of the world are you in? So I'm uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington State. And specifically, a very, very small town called Carnation, which is about 2,000 people and was named after a brand. So I literally work in a town that was named after a brand. How, wow. how perfect is it? That was destiny. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, and, and uh, I, I mean, we'll get here, but it's kind of like you were meant to be in branding. I think like, so. <laughs> if there's anybody in the world who is meant to do what you do, it's probably you. <laughs> I try. I believe me. I tried as hard as I could to run the other way, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they dragged you back in. <laughs> so, uh, if, if we could, why don't we? Why don't we start here? Why don't we start with what it is that you're up to now, so that we sure. can understand the shape of Lou's world, and uh, then then we'll do some time travel. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so what I'm up to now is that I run, uh, I guess a, you could call it a boutique, a brand and design firm, um, up here in Washington state. And I work primarily, uh, brands hire me, uh, agencies hire me and startups hire me, which is sort of perfect. Cause I spent the first sort of third of my career working at agency, working at brands and working with startups. <laughs> so a lot of the same in fact, some of the same clients that I worked with even 20 years ago, I'm still working with today on, on those projects. Wow. I always say a great new business strategy is to get a full-time job, do a good job, leave, and then have them hire you back. <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a plan. Good work if you can get it. <laughs> Outstanding. So what it, what is it, what does the day-to-day -day look like for you? Uh yeah, and and I do want to talk about where your office is because yeah. that's pretty crazy. Yeah, sure. So day to day, I have about two thirds of my work is um, or you know is or was month over month like retainer type projects. So I pretty much know what I'm working on when I start the day. Um, I have a couple projects that are just literally project based, which will come in. Um, sort of un unplanned or, yeah. you know, someone calls, someone refers and something pops up. Some of those, some of those turn into long-term projects. Some of them are just projects, you know, you do and, and, and move on. Um, so like in my mix of work right now, um, I do a monthly magazine for a, for a client, for a yachting client actually in Seattle, which is kind of funny because one of my first ever ad jobs was uh, art director, creative director for Bayliner and Maxim Boats, like what? <laughs> right out of, right out of, um, literally almost like right out of school. So right. I find myself working on boats, trains, cars, <laughs> um, planes, but, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a, I have this magazine that I do once a month. I think I'm almost approaching, I've been doing it for about four years. So almost 48 issues. Wow. And um, I started in magazines. So to have a magazine this many years later and still be in it is, is pretty fun. Um, 
So, so I work on that and that's a, that's a, I, I know, I know a, the year out when all those deadlines are. So my entire life in terms of like vacation or traveling revolves around those ship dates. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So if I, if memory serves, um, you started sort of an underground magazine in high school yeah, and almost got yourself kicked out, I think, or yeah. was it high school? Yeah. High school. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was really, uh, I, I was, so when I, when I was growing up, my, uh, my dad worked in sort of the post-production color separation business. Um, so I would go with him on press checks. I would go with him on color checks. We, and I remember when people ask me like kind of, kind of how I got into it. I I remember specifically this moment he he used to take me to the basement and that's where all these guys worked in the dark on these huge CRT yeah. monitors doing like color correction. And I remember being so fascinated, like as a probably like, you know, eight, nine, ten year old and just saying, well, like, what are they working on? It looked like they were doing magic. Yeah. And I remember him as we were going back up the stairs, because the lights were it was literally pure dark. And he said, You don't want to be down here. <laughs> you want to be working. <laughs> you want to be coming up with the things that these guys are correcting. And I, and that stuck with me, you know, it, wow. it was sort of like an offhand comment. Yeah. I was like, gosh, like, what does that mean? Like, there's more to this than, you know? And so um, I learned sort of the old school production, you know, color separation, how things were actually produced early. Yeah. And then it was sort of, then as I grew up, I learned how they actually make the thing that then gets produced. Like, how do you, how do you make an idea? How do you come up with something? So oh, um, yeah. when I, when I was in high school, I mean, I had, this, this is back in the day when like, uh, this wasn't even Quark Express. This was like <laughs> super paint on the Mac. Yeah. Oh, and um, so two of my friends uh, that I went to high school with pretty sort of on the fringe, it was a private, like a private Jesuit college preparatory school and i and i emphasize jesuit because the jesuits were actually super cool and very yeah. uh, forward thinking <laughs> um and so one of my friends came to me and said hey we're thinking about starting this 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 like alternative publication because the the high school didn't really have a newspaper and so we went to the school i don't remember who it was we went to like head of student affairs or someone and we said hey we want to start this think could you like assign us an advisor or and they're wow. like we want we want to have nothing to do with whatever you're doing and that was a critical <laughs> moment because later when we got in trouble we went back to them and said hey we went to you asked for permission right. and and you said no and that yeah. led to them uh formalizing like a not a journalism program but a actual like more uh, student publication so wow um, but I was laying the thing out like page by page because at the time there was no design program, uh, to do multi-page design. So every page was like an original. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was doing it in super paint. So you had a text box <laughs> with a, and, and I had a hand, I had a Logitech hand scanner so I could scan like things. Oh my God. Yeah. And then we I would just put, we would well. put it on the, we would put it on, we would distribute it. Actually, we never distributed it at school. We distributed it on the, the Metro buses around school. No kidding. Cause it wasn't specifically about school, but we did mention people that went to school and that's what got us in trouble. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this is like, I mean, this is around the same, same time. I want to say as uh, Richard Branson was starting a magazine that changed the world as well. It seems like there's a lot of, journalism changes things magazines oh yeah and stuff. yeah and and what's what's kind of funny is um so i was there was there was these two guys and then, and then i was considered like the other half because i would actually produce it and then um later uh when i moved to new york i worked at the village voice and it was sort of at the moment where publication editorial design i guess desktop publishing was transitioning from pay step. So even at when I was in college working on the university newspaper, we designed it, printed it out, waxed it, rolled it onto the wow. boards, and then physically delivered this box with all the individual pages. So it was sort of like um, That's so cool. this small evolution, <laughs> right? And then 
I actually, after I left the Village Voice, I got a job at Time Out New York, which was just launching. And that was launched by Tony Elliott, who started Time Out in London as kind of a zine be, to, for of things to do. Yeah. And um, then I was, I went from like doing this zine in high school to doing, I did another, I did my own magazine in college, which became my book to get, to move to New York, to get a job. And, um, and so then I was doing like a weekly, you know, the village voice, you know, weekly newspaper. It was, I don't remember how many pages wow. it was, but, and then I went to Time Out, which was a weekly. So then we're doing like 200 page magazine a week. They had a cot in the art department, which is a <laughs> sign for anybody looking for a job. If they have like hospitality arrangements in the art department. <laughs> I like I like how you call them hospitality arrangements. That's, <laughs> yeah. You must be in marketing. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was my and and the funny thing is, so, so much of what I did then, I'm I'm still doing now, and I think a lot of storytelling. I mean, I literally got my degree in journalism, and there's a lot of creative directors I run into who also got their start. And and we were doing storytelling before it was cool and advertising or branding. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember going when we moved back from New York to Seattle and I worked at Publicist and I was running the Bayliner account. So I worked at Bayliner at a small agency in Seattle. Then we moved to New York. But when I moved back, Publicist has taken that account from the agency I worked with before I moved. And then now I was running the whole thing. And oh, I remember wow. on the on the first day they were like, we need you to design, you and your team design six catalogs in a year. And I was thinking, a year? Like, we're doing 200 pages a week. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm going to poke my eyes out. This is going to be. <laughs> so so um, did, you did you turn them upside down? Like, I mean, you must have kicked them out, like, way faster. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I... I think the other thing was you don't have a you you do not have a lot of resources on the editorial side that you have on the advertising and branding side. So a lot of times you're you're designing the article, you're also sometimes you're writing the headline, sometimes you're also doing like a little illustration <laughs> or a photo collage. Yeah. And um I was in fact I was I, th I don't remember which issue it was, but early in my time out, <clears throat> sometimes we would uh the art director I was like senior designer and the art director would bring in like a special guest designer or artist to do. Right. And because the timeout covers were famous. Some of them yeah. were really famous. So, so one week we would have the meeting on Monday and he brought in Barbara Kruger who like, I did not go to graphic design school. So I did not know who she was like famous female, one of the most famous female graphic designers who did, yeah. I, you know, I shopped there for I am, which Supreme basically <laughs> ripped off Futura medium, bold, italic and red boxes <laughs> and white. So we did a cover with her. And then every week we would also do a wild posting, which is like a, a bigger version of the cover that then they would, they would put up all, all over New York ahead yeah. of the issue. I didn't know who she was. I had, I still have the original poster I did uh, and the cover. And then years later, when I figured out that's who it was, I, <laughs> I uh, was able, we were able to acquire one of the original uh, screen printed shopping, German shopping bags that she did that print on. So I have that in the house. Oh, um, cool. <laughs> so there was like, it was sort of like you're doing the work and then you're getting kind of a little bit of a history of, graphic design in real time yeah no um, that also that also uh uh also happened with david carson because they were doing an article on on and it wasn't the end of print i think it was his next book and they were like can you go down to this studio and um i think i i think i interviewed either i interviewed him or i photographed or something to get to to meet but i didn't know who it was so they just gave me an address. I took, a, I think I walked, I knocked on the door and there's David Carson answers the door. And this is someone who like, I, I was following in like late high school, college, yeah. seeing all this and then kept up with over time and actually ran into him again 
when I was the global creative director at Brooks running oh an agency we worked with had hired him to work on concepts. And uh, so we've, we've, we've intersected a few times. <laughs> That's so wild. I want to talk about intersection for a second and, and maybe, maybe inception would be the better word yeah. <laughs> because I, I think your, your great grandfather was one yeah. of the original madmen. Yeah. Uh, and again, if memory serves, came up with some of the most memorable uh, campaigns, even yeah. that exist today. Yeah. Could we talk a little bit about that and how that m maybe is infused in your DNA? <laughs> yeah. So I remember, um, you know, growing up, um, sometimes my dad would bring home or I would get a, so I don't know, so I don't know how it happened, but sometimes I would get copies of communication arts. <laughs> as kids you know, do <laughs> other kids are like sesame street magazine ranger rick <laughs> right scholastic I, you know i'm looking at like the the, the 1987 design annual trying to like draw and recreate the ads oh, um God. i feel it, like honestly it wasn't it, it wasn't until later on i mean i think past even high school that i you know, I, I, I talked to my uncle who he went to this uh, art institute of Chicago. He worked at like Playboy magazine. He was he knew about design. My 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 other uncle was like um, an artist and screen printer. My dad worked in, you know, post production. But and then my grandmother, <clears throat> she lived to like 95. She would she would give between my uncle and her. They would give me things, little things like a coffee mug or my my uncle gave me like a uh like a walter uh, like a lander design annual and i'd be flipping through it and i'd be like heinz ketchup maxin and i'm like what's this and so <laughs> so i get the story goes that he was um he was born in ohio his family moved on away michigan which is northern michigan not the not the up but northern michigan um and then uh he he grew up, he was actually serving, he, he worked in the, I think the lunch wagon at Ford, pitched Henry Ford on an idea for Lincoln and started the agency at 28. And he was doing a lot of direct mail type stuff. So his way to get, he sort of had a Trojan horse to get into the juicy stuff by getting in through the non-juicy stuff, which was the direct mail accounts. Wow. And he would, apparently he would write you know, he was sort of a, a Bo Jackson of advertising. I don't think he was really a designer, but he would write and pitch directly to the clients. Wow. Um, he won Gillette, came up with the Look Sharp, Be Sharp campaign, the Gillette Parrot, and then convinced Gillette to sponsor Friday Night Fights, which I don't know if that was because I wasn't alive then, but uh, <laughs> boxing, basically boxing matches on the radio or TV. And then convinced Gillette to sponsor the World Series, which was the first advertising brand sports. Wow. I guess a co-branded collaboration that we would call today. And then I think that that um, collaboration eventually evolved into I, what I had heard was it evolved into what was ABC Wide World of Sports. You're what mm. the hell? Yeah. So Holy Wow. And then, he, and then he had, say, he had Heinz for 30 years. Heinz Ketchup knew the family, like, pretty, you know, obviously pretty well. He had um, Hot Point GE. Um, I have a, uh, I, I tracked down in Onaway, I think towards the end, end of his run, um, they did a Max and Day in Onaway. And they, all the advertisers took out a full page ad in this newspaper in Onaway. So I did get a copy of it and I have it in my studio and it's letters like handwritten and ads basically that all these brands took out in the, in the local newspaper. Um, and I have his typewriter on my desk. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and I have a handwritten client list and a lot, like I, over the, like sometimes I'll find stuff on eBay. Like, um, I found there was like an original print of one of their offices in Detroit and I've got old ads from Gillette. And he did a lot of uh, storytelling ads, like uh, comic strips and cartoons to tell stories about how people use the product, which, um, I mean, I've done a lot of that in my work. So I don't like, yeah. 
even before I knew that that was happening, it was sort of part of my thing. And so I've just Isn't sort of crazy. Uh, I've just sort of like uh, been collecting stuff as I find it, and then sharing it with my kids and. When, pe- when people come over, um, you know, that's kind of part of the, the, the tour they have to suffer through. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a, what a legacy. Yeah, his, it was pretty. Well, the craziest thing is that they, how I kind of found out about it was uh, in, in northern, in Michigan. So we went back to Onaway. There was a 700-acre piece of land they bought by Black Lake. And that turned into kind of the max, the, the a retreat where they would clients could go up there, agency folks and families could go up there during the spring and summer. It was wow. like Google before Google, right? They had a <laughs> barber shop, they had all these amenities, and you could be out sort of in nature. Now that's the now a huge part of that is what is now the UAW. No kidding. The UAW bought it from, um, but a lot of the the original lodge and the wood from that from that project came from like Oregon and Washington. So um, wow. our little compound that we have out here on 41 acres in the Pacific Northwest is like a little mini version of, <laughs> of, of like working in, in nature. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. That, and that, I'm just going to jump on that segue yeah. because I, I appreciate jump you. On ser- the train. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate you serving that up. Uh, so, so eloquently it, it is very unique. Your studio <laughs> And I'd like you to sort of walk us through it because it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And it's yeah. got a story and life all of its own. Yeah, for sure. So we were, this was like 2000, let's see, 2007. Um, my wife and I, we, at the time our kids were little, we have three, three sons. We were living um, in a small town called Snoqualmie, which is where Snoqualmie Falls is and which is, also where they filmed uh, Twin Peaks, North Bend, oh. Twin Peaks <laughs> area. So it's about it's it's about 20 minutes from where we are now in Carnation. But um, we were, you know, family was growing. We were looking, we were actually, we were having another kid. And so we were looking at just like upgrading and, and built and buying a new house. But because the way the, the lines and the boundaries were drawn for school, if we, if we moved, we might have to pull our kids out of school. <laughs> And oh. so we were like, well, if we have to do that, like, like that, let's think bigger. And I, I had spent uh, quite a bit of time in my like professional career. I was I was um, at an agency called Story Worldwide, and our big client was Lexus. So I, I had traveled around the world for five, six years, seeing all the shooting these amazing car spots and stories for Lexus magazine and other things, films at these amazing places around the world. And then before that at Seattle magazine, we were shooting in people's homes by architects from around, yeah. you know, the, the area here before, again, I knew who any of them were. And so we ended up hiring uh, an architect in Seattle. Um, I named uh, Olson Kundig is the architecture firm and Tom Kundig is the architect and they have a, they have an office in New York and, in Seattle at the time, just Seattle. But, um, uh, so we planned, we, we found a property in Carnation. We didn't really know Carnation before yeah. this. Um, but we found a property and, and my vision was at the time I had an office in the house and the kids are little and running around and people are coming over. And I was like that, what I did learn is I, I need an office, but I do not want to work in the house. I want to, <laughs> so the, my only brief to Tom was, um, I need to be able to physically separate myself from the house, <laughs> you know, and um, I give him a lot of credit because he, he sort of took that and, and sent it back to me and said, what if we do X, you know, what, what if like this, this brief ingredient for me to him was, okay, you don't want to work in the house. What if you work in a building detached from the house. And they, they were working, the famous story is they were working on a project for another client and they had investigated a concept about moving a building, uh, like a mother-in-law building on a system of, ra- moving a series of buildings on rails that could they could sort of dock with the mothership and then right. send, oh. you could send people away, right? If they're staying, if they're <laughs> visiting for a long time and you're like, 
you know, <laughs> so they had they had actually done the some of the engineering. They had a model of this little like of a basically a base with wheels, and it would take a, you know, a few horsepower motor to move like a you know a few uh, thousand square feet or something right, built, yeah. structure. But they but it, that project didn't go forward. So he said, you know, he said. Uh, what if, what if we put your office on rails and you could just sort of like go in and work, but if you wanted to, you could just take off and scoot out into the woods, right? <laughs> and who does I, this, I, Lou? I remember, I remember <laughs> like thinking, because we, they had pitched us like on the master plan with the house and everything. And, and then I had gone back in and met with him, just me. And I remember on the drive home thinking, God, like, how do you, like, this is going to be probably like the biggest non advertising sell job I'm ever going to have to do, like, at <laughs> home. Like, how am I going to convince my wife that we're going to build this studio that's going to, on rails, it's going to, you know. Oh my God. And at that time, like, he had sketched basically, uh, like, a, a one story sort of box that was the same height as the house. And and that was sort of the beginning. And from that, I sort of almost took the project on as a, like I would it with a client. I went into I volunteered for the um, a committee in town for a destination branding for Carnation because they were looking to get more people to come out to Carnation. And through that, I met um, a few of the elders in town that had lived here forever and and started learning that there was actual railroad that the town the reason it's called Carnation is because the original dairy research farm is here in Carnation. And the reason it's here is because someone at the farm got tipped off that the great Northern railroad was coming this way. And they wanted to be located geographically near so that they could bring cows in, they could send milk out. And um, so it turns out there's two major railroads, uh, the great Northern and the Milwaukee road. Um, they had a branch line through town and our house and our railway and our studio sit parallel to those where those railroads were in town. And those railroads really put the town on the map. Um, our property is on a second growth warehouse or a tree farm. <laughs> and, and there was logging rail, there was log, there was a uh, logging rail up here operations wow. where they would just lay rail down, bring temporary rail cars, get the trees off. They had low, you know, locomotive, donkey locomotives, stuff like that. And so there was like a real rich railroad history here that I had no clue about. Like, um, so you weren't like a railway guy that was looking for a railway life. Like, no, <laughs> I was the guy looking to get away from, <laughs> from some of the noise. And then I turned into like a train nut basically. <laughs> Okay, so just just so that people, uh, I'm at, sure at this point people are like, "What the hell, Lou?" Um, <laughs> yeah. So in the in the show notes, wherever we put them, we'll yeah. have links because there's been some really great coverage about this project. Yeah. Um. Okay, so how did how did the town of Carnation take to this idea of you building this thing? Well, I mean, to be fair, so we're we're uh, we're literally like we're geographically out of this the city limit. So we're, we are the prop, the tree farm, the warehouser farm sits about 430 feet above town and the town, the town is in a valley. So it floods, you know, if there's a, if there's <laughs> so the, like there's the, 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 um, Tolt river goes through town. Um, and, uh, so we didn't, we didn't have to deal with like the town of Carnation, um, right. so, like some people in Carnation, that know us know it's here but like we're we kind of look out over the valley from from above and we're really hidden our site is super forested so uh, like right now i'm at literally at the end of the line like i'm sitting in the train and i'm at the end of uh, of the line so it's it's pretty hidden in the trees and the exterior of the house and the train is uh rolled steel which patinas and looks like tree bark so it, it's it's architecture that's designed to sort of seamlessly vanish. Wow. It's not architecture that's um, like uh, you clear cut and you're like, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that so is so, so cool. it's, it's a little it's a little different, but we have had a lot of tours and we've um, 
you know, it's been featured on TV and, and, and literally I, I laugh because it's, it's this little 110 foot railway yeah. that has literally traveled around the world through, you know, the New York times, the daily mail, yeah. uh, NBC. And so, um, I, I think it's kind of a sign that people, whether you like trains or not, it doesn't really matter. I think it's just sort of a, it's a pro, it's a project that turned into a much bigger thing than I ever expected. But in many ways, the studio itself is a great calling card for my work because I don't necessarily do things the way everybody else does, which, you know, is I guess why I'm on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, oh, you couldn't not be. <laughs> outstanding so okay so here's a here's a question for you um and i'm assuming you get out and about uh i mean oh, yeah. just large acreage and stuff like that but um do you like do you have sort of a, a pathway through the woods like do you is that part of your ritual to just sort of ground yourself in nature or are you missing the city uh yeah so i have um well, my my middle son uh, Jack, he actually when he comes home from college, he would he started making trails through the woods, and then I I would be I remember when I even when I was like working at agencies or working at startups, I'd always try to go. I I, I was a big fan of like walking meetings, like taking one or two people and we would just go walk if there was a park, nice. and I always remember we'd come up with like great things. So that was something. I'd, I'd go for walks and I'd find these trails like that the kids had made. <laughs> There'd be like two <laughs> chairs out in the middle of the woods and almost like, you know, in a, at ad agencies when they come up with funny names for conference rooms like Mount Rainier or whatever, like yeah. we're literally have like these little miniature moments throughout the property wow. where there's um, like two plastic chair, Adirondack chairs in like different spots. So when it's nice out, you can just go sit there and take a meeting or so I'm in, I'm in this, I'm in the studio. I'm not in every single day, you know, if I have meetings or, but, um, and I'll come in here to do client work and I'll also come in here to do non-client work. So downstairs where I'm sitting is my desk is sort of like the, um, Starship Enterprise, right? Like this is where everything is, but upstairs, um, there's a, you can see behind me, there's a ladder. And there's a dumbwaiter that goes up there so I can put my books, laptop drinks up there. And upstairs is a full library. And in the original, um, in the caboose, which was the office of the railroad, the crew worked from the caboose. But upstairs was the cupola. And that's where you can kind of see, you can see above the train yeah. and see sort of ahead. And And for me, conceptually, that's like where I go when clients come or collaborators will go upstairs and there's two there's two Eames chairs up there and the wall is um rolled steel but it's all magnetic so we can put things up that we're working on and and then I can also change the view like if I like today I'm at the end I might roll down to the middle of the railway to um or I can go upstairs and be up higher and sort of look so you know, creatives never like being in the same spot, right? You always want to like shift your perspective, your your, your perspective, yeah. and um, so I'm always changing this wall, this wall of 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 like train stuff, advertising, design stuff. It's always yeah. shifting. We did a we we host shoots here sometimes for uh, clients, and or and or brands will come and rent out. Um, the house or the studio and so sometimes I have to take everything down for the oh shoot God. and then I like oh do I and I never put it up the same way again <laughs> that's amazing so let, let, let me let me let me uh, let me get into your head for a second yeah and so you're let's just say for the sake of argument that you're um I don't know you roll back you know <laughs> half halfway back to the house and you're you climb the ladder. You got yourself a a drink, whatever it is that that happens to be. You Mountain got your Dew. Library, Mountain Dew. You've got your <laughs> uh, your view around you, and you're pondering the universe, <laughs> as as I firmly believe that you do on a regular basis. And Lou, what is the one thing that you wish the world knew about me, or or in general? <laughs> like you're just sitting there thinking about. <laughs> life the universe and everything and yeah be like oh if the world just knew this one thing uh, like yeah i'm 
I think for me, and especially now, you know, with um, everything <clears throat> that's going on, like in the world, in the creative world, with AI, with, you know, with everything is that um, I, I have, and I think I have this on my LinkedIn. It's like, I really do. And I, and I, when I like work with other creatives, especially like younger creatives or mentoring um, to never lose caring about the work. Like it's easy to, like for me, I mean, I can be cynical, right? I can say, oh, wow, look, it's Canva or AI or all these things. And yeah. and I and there's always this lament from creatives about like losing the care or the craft of the work, especially the digital work. Um, and what's funny is like when you come in here, like 99.9% .9 of the things in here are not digital. They're phys like the this the sign over there that's that's the um a, a movie prop off the train from the Darjeeling limited and most of the stuff you know some railroad stuff some but it's a physical tangible things and so for me yeah i always i always want people to know that you can whether it's a personal project or you can sort of like slip it in like medicine in the candy for a client project that they're that like don't give up because there's always opposing forces i remember when i was at seattle magazine and like pdf came out and i'm like holy crap we're screwed <laughs> yeah right <laughs> no <laughs> like who's now i'm responsible for whatever pdf i send that's what's going to get printed or yeah. or i'm not physically handling mechanicals anymore yeah. Or, um, you know, and, you know, I was listening to the, the episode with, with Dave from Aletro that was on your, on your, and then I'm getting connected with him. And, you know, I, I love the bit he talked about, like everything about AI is so sort of like the world is ending and the robots are taking over. But what if we create stories that aren't, aren't that? And, yeah. and, and I've, I've done quite a bit of work in, in these new frontiers already and working with clients that are doing work in the, in those frontiers. And I think the, the most hopeful positive thing is that as a client or as a, I guess as an agency or as a creative, you still get to choose at the end of the day, like we're casting for great clients, like great people. Yeah. It used to be when I was starting out, I'd be like, oh, I want to work on Coke. I want to work on this. I want to work on Nike. I want to work. Yeah. But but I, what I learned over time was that it's really actually more important that you find the right people to work with. Oh, because man. if you find the right people, they'll, the right projects come with it. And then the right potential for, for outcomes. And um, so, and I think I'm an overly optimistic person because I think once a creative person is not optimistic, they, that's when you really should think about doing something else because we're, we're here not to compete with other agencies. We're here to help create work and to see around the corner. Yeah. You know, we couldn't get through this podcast without talking about hockey or Gretzky, <laughs> but I, but I, but I do think that, um, you know, part, part of what we're here to do is to sort of figure out where, where things are going or, or create a runway for our clients where they, the investment in the work they do with us and the work we do together is creating something for the future. Right. Yeah. And that hopefully that's a positive future because why else would anybody want to like wake up and stare at the you know blinking cursor on the white page oh yeah you know? <laughs> that's a, that, what a nightmare yeah I, 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 like one of the questions i like always comes to mind is like how do you how do you make things memorable like how do you take something from uh from obscurity to being ubiquitous with our you know our collective conscience and i think that you hit on it is this idea of, you know, finding stories that matter, finding clients that you are willing to go there with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, wow. I, I think, you know, I have this discussion <clears throat> with a couple of collaborators I work with and it's, I think a lot of people think the creative job is to sort of frost the cupcake, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and there's a lot of work out there that is, is, is that like some projects sure. are just that, but if you're there at the, at the moment when you're deciding, like when the client, 
when the ingredients are delivered in the brief and you actually get to figure out that you haven't actually figured out if the ingredients make a cupcake or make something, you know, then if you can deliver like the, the cake and the frosting together in a great, like that's, those are the projects that make it into the, the book. Um, but I think more importantly, I think those are the projects that actually work for the client, like for the clients. Cause I think the clients, they, 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 the good ones don't just want the frosting. The good ones right. realize that the frosting's nothing and without the cake. And I think that's, I, I did a, I did a project right before COVID, um, in, uh, in, in London for a dot com, like an e commerce, not, not Amazon. And, um, it was like June. And th- th- this, this, if I have time to tell this story, it's probably yes. one of my favorite projects. So I, I'm in. So, um, I'm, so I, I had, I had got, I had interviewed for this project. I had interviewed with the CEO, the head of marketing. And basically, there, this was like in like June of 2018 or 19, right before COVID. Um, and they're like, we need TV. We need a new TV, cam- a new brand campaign and TV by Thanksgiving. And it's like June. Whoa. And I was just, my wife and I were actually just getting ready to take the, the Amtrak from Seattle to Chicago on the Empire Builder, which Whoa. is named after the, which is basically the nickname for James Hill, who, who started the, um, the uh the great northern so we took we took amtrak from seattle to chicago we went to um chicago msi to see the huge model railroad layout uh that that is like an ho model railroad layout that doc that documents like the history of railroading from seattle to chicago wow. As chicago is like a huge you know railroad hub of america and then seattle with the ports and then, and then we went to um, the Art Institute of Chicago, and we were downstairs in um, in the basement, and they have this thing called the Thorn Miniatures, and it's basically this really wealthy woman from Chicago commissioned all these miniature sets of all these rooms from around the world, and you walk through this kind of maze, and it's like like from Japan to the United States to Europe, and. Um, it's like these little windows into these miniature worlds. So we're going, we're going through there. I didn't even know that existed. So we're going there. And as we come out at the end, there's a little plaque on the wall and it's Wes Anderson. And, and he's talking about how he loves the Thorn miniatures because he loves these, you know, his fanatical love of these dioramas and miniature yeah. worlds. So we're in Chicago for a few days and, and I knew I had this like to come up with this thing and, so we get back on the train and head back. And while while we're on the while I'm on the train for like, you know, 36 hours <laughs> over. <laughs> um one of the challenges of this brief was that we didn't have a lot of time. And this company represented all these brands like kids' toys, women's, you know, clothes, accessories. And in order to get permission, legal permission to photograph all those things would take forever, right? To get the legal permission to show products from those brands. And yeah. and so time was actually a great constraint of the brief. The the miniatures sparked this notion, which was what if and this and the the comp the brand didn't exist in real life. Like you couldn't go to a store and buy these things. You could only do it through your phone. So the right. phone became this portal, like the the exhibit, where you could go in and build this miniature world where you could kind of virtually shop in these different aisles and parts of this like virtual department store. So I came back and I was like totally psyched. So I went in <laughs> and and I talked to the marketing guy and I was like, I, I think I have this like idea. And I was showing him some references. And then he's like, okay, you need to go in and meet with the CEO. So then I prepared like kind of a pitch. And I went in and did this whole thing and was showing him some things. And I was showing him some references from like Fantastic Mr. Fox at the end when they're all in the in the grocery store. And he's like, this is, he's like, oh, this sounds really cool. What's, what's Wes Anderson? I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> And any, you know, any other person might have just said, oh, we're screwed, you know, but I was like, okay. So I came back, I prepared and I I gave him some uh, homework assignment to watch a couple of the movies, the stop motion movies. 
So I got them. So they're like, look, we don't really care what you do or how you do it. We just need TV by this time. Right. So I'm wow. like, oh. so I'm like, okay. So then I went up, um, a, a production company I work with, a creative group up in um, Seattle, up in uh, Capitol Hill called Content Partners, who I had worked with before a lot. We worked on like Star Trek Into Darkness. And um, I went up there and I was totally psyched and I talked to them. And I was thinking at the point, right, at this point, it's probably like, we're, we're probably going to like talk to local stop motion people. We're probably going to talk to someone at Leica in Portland because that's a, I mean, that's an epicenter of stop motion in the U S is Leica. And so we were, they, I had the, I had like the pitch, I had the visuals, the references, I had photos of people working on sets showing to, to sh explain what stop motion was. Cause I had this idea that if we created this really care cared for and crafted like analog three-dimensional world yeah we sort of could um humanize the digital you know realm so yeah, cross the barrier so like i gave it to them like a week later they called and i'm thinking like okay they're going to take some references pull together some ideas and um they're like well actually like we showed it around and you know there's people here that could do it um but um Someone on a producer that they worked with had worked with um, Mark Gustafson, who actually just passed away. But he was he did the stop motion for uh, Pinocchio that won an Oscar. Oh, my God. And um, so they knew of a group over in London, um, uh, animation production, kind of an animation rep called Not to Scale, and there was a guy, there was a guy, um, um, Anthony, who had worked on Fantastic Mr. Fox and I Love Dogs. And they're like, hey. they're like, why don't, like, instead of using these as reference, like, and he was like literally in one of the photos I had pulled for my like swipe for like inspiration. So they're like, why don't we just go to London and work with all these, this build this team that worked on, that worked with Wes on these movies. What the hell? And so uh, we worked, there was a lot of pre-production. We did storyboards, uh, had to identify all the like color palettes per category, basically kind of built, a, it's almost like a brand playbook for the campaign. Wow. And then um, did like, I guess, team Skype. This is, I mean, this is before COVID. So some virtual like back and forth with style treatments. And then, um, kind of like headed over to London for two, two, two long trips. And we were in the, the studio that we were in, they shot the scene from, um, Grand Budapest hotel when they're, when they're skiing, that was all stop motion. <laughs> oh my God. And, um, it came, I remember like, so it was, it was, we had not a lot of time. I mean, it was like, we made it, we got the things delivered. I remember, the night I we were at like the pub and I had messaged the marketing guy at, at the brand. And then he's like, she send the link to the CEO. And then I get a text from the seat for an email from the CEO. That was like, okay, it's like, okay, great. I love, I loved everything. It's like, uh, what you say, when, when can I make like changes? I'm like, you can't make changes. It's like, this is like <laughs> stop motion. It's like dominoes. You can't. And um, we, we had to like change. Like, I think we, I kind of isolated for him things that we could like in the, at the end, like the call to action, things that weren't physically like, right. cause we even, we even had, um, we went up to Birmingham where uh, Yemen nations was, and they did a lot of the physical, they made over like 200 miniature props. And there's a, like a, a area where fashion designers go to pick out materials for things. And the, the miniature yellow couch, which I have on my desk here from this, from the shoot, the we used the leather the extra leather from that to make the type for the the campaign was called the joy of shopping so the actual joy of shopping type was made out of the same so it to me like digital is a screen right yeah. it's a frame but i think people think everything has to be uh pixel perfect for things and i'm working on an app right now a mobile app for a new startup and that's like pixel perfect like in figma everything mm -hmm. is like yeah. Everything is like perfect, right? Yeah. And 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 that can be beautiful and work, 
but that that project um i then since worked with like three i did three more animated projects with with that group and oh my god and um you know it just it's like you just need one of those projects to kind of propel you forward and say like people people the uh, projects can be in the rearview mirror but it's really the people that travel with you to the future projects right yeah. oh, so yeah. for me like on this train there's some straight lines that i take and there but there's a lot of branch branches off that eventually you make it back on the main line but <laughs> these branches these branch like excursions are the ones that like i think give the day to day the main line flavor yeah. and um so that's kind of what for me that's the exciting part and um I just like I'm still mesmerized by the level of I mean they're in there with you know it, it reminds me of being a kid and like making models yeah. you know yeah <laughs> just ob- obsessed yeah oh I okay I'd be remiss because you did ask the or you did mention this earlier and I would be uh, as a Canadian remiss not oh, yeah. asking and I, <laughs> how okay there's a picture of you and yeah. Wayne Gretzky hanging out. What's that yeah. about? Tell me, tell me the reader's so digest. I'm, yeah, so uh, this is like rewind back to my time at Le- at Lexus. So Lexus did this um, court, quarterly magazine. It was a lifestyle magazine. It was really beautiful. Uh, I went from like having no money on my high school <laughs> Z to like working on Lexus, which you know we had essentially three months for every issue and and would travel around the country and around the world for every issue to to it was like doing a magazine on an advertising budget and this was this was like heyday so this is in terms of budgets like we were flying around the world we were staying if we went to singapore we're staying at the four seasons or raffles where like you lived the life of your audience at, at, like going going to Japan, going. So we would <clears throat> we would do these meetings with the client, um, and they're always in some great place. So this one was in Nice, France. Like we took a helicopter to the hotel just to get to the hotel, and so we're <laughs> sitting at this pool, and we would we would pitch the lineup for the next issue, right? And there was a there was a section in the magazine called Quick Study, and it was basically. And these writers were from, you know, like, like the new, it was freelance writers from the top publications around the world writing for this. And wow. so I had seen this thing called um, uh, the Wayne Gretzky Fantasy Camp. And um, I don't know where I saw it, but um, I thought, wow, this would be perfect for a quick study, which was essentially a writer sort of immerses themselves in a, in a world for a short amount of time and gets to experience that world. It's a two page spread in the magazine. Cool. Yeah. And so this Gretzky camp was like $9,999. Of course. And, and um, <laughs> the trouble was that Wayne was associated. I don't know if he still is with Ford of Canada, like, Oh, okay. And so Lexus, eh, but I, so I'm in the, well, like we're sitting with the client in the pool in Nice, it's like hotter than shit out. I think if there were like four, there were like fires. It was really hot. Wow. It was like 2003. Um, and so we get around to like my part. And I, so I did my, like my spiel and talked about um, Lexus was actually at the time um, they were sponsoring a lot of, they were like sponsoring like the Florida Panthers arena. And oh, wow. um, I mean, hockey's not cheap, you know, and um Lexus was a was a brand that was attached already to hockey. Um, like if you drove a Lexus, you could get uh, um, like VIP parking at these arenas. And so there were like privileges like Lexus Club. And so they were like, wow, this sounds great. And you play hockey. Um, so it was a week. And I this was when Wayne was uh, attached to the Coyotes and they were playing in Glendale. Um, so I flew from Seattle and I spent a week at the fantasy camp. So it was like him. It was basically a lot of the old Edmonton Oilers, no Paul Coffee, Paul Coffee, Glenn Anderson, um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, let's see, Wayne's dad. Um, so they took, there was a lot of like LA celebrities that like flew in, like the, t- like, uh, um, Cuba, uh, not, I don't think Cuba Gooding Jr. was at that one, but like, there's a kind of like a, a little racket of LA hockey oh, celebrities. Right. Um, and so they, we did like a, a skate. They basically drafted everybody into four teams for the week. And our, um, Wayne's dad was our coach for the week. Get out of town. Was my, was my coach. Oh my and then God. you got to, <clears throat> you got to play a certain number of games were guaranteed. And then there was like a play, a tournament to win the Gretzky cup. And, um, so you played against Wayne and you played with Wayne on your team and he didn't wear a helmet, you know, so nobody would hit him. We had every, every year the camp was a different team that he played on. So that year was the New York Rangers. Yeah. And, um, so they have like massage, like you got treated like a pro athlete for the day. So we played at the Coyotes practice facility. Then the finals were at the, where they, the Coyotes played and our team made it all the way to the final. And then we, we won. And, oh my God. and, um, so we're that night, they had like the award ceremony and I was hanging out. Um, I was hanging out outside cause you could bring a friend. So I brought my college roommate and, um, we were like hanging out outside of the room and this car pulls up and this guy gets out and he goes and opens the trunk and there's this big black case. And I was like looking at my friend Jeff and I was like, shit, I think that's the guy. I think that's the Stanley cup guy, the guy, Phil. Oh my God. Like the guy, and, and Wayne had had the cup brought in. And so our team that had won, we each got a, a signed original Wayne Gretzky stick. He's a left-handed um, TPS stick. And then they brought the cup in and we each got to, to raise the cup. Oh my you know? God. It was insane. And then I'm thinking like, at one point, like I look up, like, and I'm like supposed to guard Wayne. I'm going into the corner with like Wayne Gretzky. And then, <laughs> and then I'm on, and then he's on our team and like, you're skating up the ice and you see Paul Coffey is like lapping you as the defenseman on the left side. So I, I wrote an article. I wrote an article. We did a video for Lexus. And then um, after it came out, I sent a couple copies to Wayne's representative. And then like in the mail one day, I got a package back and he had he had took one of the copies and wrote like a handwritten note on the article Like, you know, great, you know, thanks for the article. Great, you know, Wayne. And then um, I have like signed score sheets in my house with me assisting, you know, Wayne. And and then at the end, I mean, by that time, like I was out of, obviously out of college, out of playing like competitive hockey. And I'm like, how do you go back to beer league after this? (laughs) (laughs) Like everything is a disappointment. (laughs) You're up here. Yeah. No, yeah, no, it was like, I mean, I grew up playing tennis with uh on basketball courts outside with tennis balls trying to shoot between the fence posts and a kid from seattle's you know not not supposed to end up playing hockey with wayne gretzky so it was it was uh it was pretty i i still have yeah i have i have a couple of pucks here and i have the sticks and um yeah it's pretty magical uh well so you are I th- i think we can qualify you as a canadian yeah. Okay. I'll sure. yeah, you know, just just by virtue of that that connection, the one one degree of separation with Wayne Gretzky that you know we all have as Canadians. So yeah, um, yeah. W- exactly. Welcome, welcome to Canada. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, what a fascinating story. What a ride you've had, Lee. This is so cool. Oh, I mean, I think you know the thing. The, the other thing is like I've got. I mean, in in design, you know, like David Carson and uh, I. I've met a lot of people that, you know, you, you hear of like icons, some great, some not great when you meet them. Um, but, uh, Wayne is at, is as advertised, you know, super humble, great collaborator. And, you know, I I think I, I mean, I didn't, I got to spend some like one-on-one time because we did the, we did a shoot and everything with him, but where I could really tell about who he was, was uh, by having his dad uh, with us that week. Yeah. Because you could tell the kind of person that Wayne turned out to be 
by how his dad was around the the guys and um he the funny part was he he was sort of like i don't have time to remember any of your names so he just basically would map every player to a player that wayne played with so like he would he i remember in the finals like we were up by like one but there was like a minute left or something and he's like he would call me jeff bookaboom who played for like the rangers and he's like go go into the corner and just do whatever you can to hold the puck holder up against the corner so we can run out the clock. He's like, I don't care if it's dirty. I don't care. He's like, we need to win. <laughs> and I remember just going in the corner and I'm like, you're not going to tell no to Wayne Gretzky's dad. <laughs> and I have a copy of the, um, it was the last cover that he was on for ESPN magazine. And I have that in my, in, in our, in our house with Wayne and Wayne's dad. Um, signed on it so it's pretty it's pretty special yeah no kidding what a that's that's amazing thank you for sharing that story that <laughs> yeah. just you know makes me feel so good knowing, <laughs> knowing that connection exists um okay so i have a question for you and yeah. it's one of my favorite parts of the show and um there's people out in the world that are exploring and doing different things, whatever they happen to be. Some people are like the, you know, their CEO is deciding to do a new venture. Other people are maybe students in marketing who are just like, oh, I want to, I want to care about something or want to do this. Well, I'll call these people rebels in waiting because they haven't quite done yeah. it yet. What advice would you give to those rebels in waiting to how to take that next step or how to take the plunge? Yeah. I remember, um, I remember at Lexus, they had these different demographics for the customers. And one of them was called Maverick, you know, and yeah. it's fun. It's, it was kind of funny because to, to think about working with a brand that had a category to describe something or somebody that really didn't fit in a category, like it felt wrong <laughs> almost <laughs> like they had, like they had like the stretch family yeah. who like, it was a, it was like a reach to own a Lexus. They had, and then they had like the Maverick and I remember like reading it and going, Oh God, like, and then, and then, you know, like when I moved over and I, I did some work with BMW, they, they had a different word for it. But yeah. I think for me, um, and I think this is probably true, like outside of marketing or brand, like this is a true thing about the, just like life in general, is that the I was like one of those people that would like write the letter to the editor or pitch the thing about Gretzky or even like with the house, like reach out to Olsen Kundig and say, hey, we're going to do this or, or the train or the thing. And I think I don't think there's any accidents about rebels. Like I don't think rebel. I don't think I think people who whether you call yourself for that or a maverick, like they're people who act on their instinct, you know, and, and even if they know something else, they have like an instinct that they know, well, I could do it this way. And I kind of know the outcome. They always sort of pivot to the, to the, the, the dangerous thing. And they're okay sort of operating without a safety net, you know, because if you do try and miss it's still more exciting than if you didn't try, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I think, <laughs> I think that's, you know, there was this great, um, I don't know if you ever saw it. was a documentary called art and copy. No, it was, um, a design, a design or advertising and George Lois was on there and he was talking about, um, he was, he, they was talking about like how he came up with the idea for, um, Calvin Klein when he did the big billboard in times square and, he it was like all the greats and it was like a fill in the blank and then he had calvin klein's name on there and calvin klein's like i was so nervous i, I was just like this shy fashion designer and he's like look you can either be brave and bold and do something and then figure it out later or you can spend a shit ton of money in advertising to to try to get to the same place and he's like right. he's like people got to remember like the water is not you know 50 feet deep and full of sharks a lot of times it's like two feet deep like yeah. you're and so it's really not that risky right <laughs> it's really not um and i i think i the the other thing i would say is and i'm a big proponent of this because i had good creative mentors tell me this is never stop doing personal work you know like creatively because i got to the point where i would look at when i was looking at 
design portfolios or photography portfolios, I always would tell people, students, whatever, come up, like in your book, I'm looking for like a consistency of fundamentals. Like, right. do you have the tools to get up to the mountain? Uh, check. But what I really wanted to see was like, what are you doing when you're not doing what yes. you're doing? Because I think that area, that's like the risk. Real. That's the fundamentals are just sort of like oxygen that everybody is required to have to be in this industry. But it's yeah. the stuff that you're sort of surrounding, like. Or how and, you see it, yeah. and that's that's like for me even like this the studio project or the house project they weren't like graphic design or branding projects, but they were they were um, personal projects that like now actually out of this project, I I'm working on two train related projects. You know what I mean? So you just you don't and and you know. Five years ago, I mean, I had a model train growing up, but five years ago, I wouldn't even like, what, like, what are you talking about trains, you know? Yeah. And it's, you, you don't know where those personal projects are going to go. And I think the personal projects, I always try to have a personal project. So when I, when I um, talk about like, what's, what's coming next or whatever, like an uh, analog personal project helps me get through some of those, you know, <laughs> Some of those moments when I'm maybe doing like the pixel perfect thing, it's where it's more just like riding a bicycle. Yeah, you know, like you're practicing the craft, but you you look down and you realize like you're still on the peloton. You're not like actually outside. You're not like dodging a ball. Like you're not really taking a lot of risk, right? Yeah. So I think that's um, for me like the personal projects and just the the risks the risks can start like in baby steps. I find that like now for me, taking a risk is not a big deal. I think it's because I've, t I've taken a lot. Some of them I failed, some of them I've succeeded, but I think you have to, it's like the 10,000 hours thing. I think as you move through the risks, the risks seem less risky or, and it's not, I think the other thing is, I think people going back to that comment about coming out like you think you need to work for the big brands yeah i actually think like i have clients now that i worked with like 25 years and some of those projects are not huge they're not huge brands but they're fantastic stories and because of the trust and relationship that you get with a client like that you can then go tell that story to another client that may be bigger but you get to do so much more of that product like for for this client I'm working with on on the app, like I'm I'm designing an app, I'm designing everything ar around building the world for this specific project. Things that like even my wife's like, why are you picking out, you know, why are you designing uniforms? Why you, like <laughs> and 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 I think it's kind of like if you state that these are the only things that you do, then that's right. all you're going to get hired for. But if you solve bigger problems and if you can help take a client like from the station out to the way you know then they're going to trust you to solve those bigger things and i think if you have the it's a fine line between if you have the confidence which is backed up by the work then that shows and they're gonna take that journey with you and i think those i've gotten to work on the big stuff and what i realized is the big stuff is really fun it's sort of like the frosting Right. Like you get a hit of it and you're like, ah, but it's not just it. The Some of the bigger, bigger, bigger brands, they're in the, they're in a risk management stance. Like yeah. they don't want to F things up. Totally. And so you're going to do incremental evo evolutions or elevations of existing things. Yeah. It's not a yeah. playground for invention. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Holy Lou, I could, I could talk to with you for hours and I, I expect that we will. I want to, we're going to have to do this again. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. Because I, I feel, I feel I, like we're just sort of scratched the surface of all this stuff. Oh man. I have one, I have like one more super quick one. Yeah. It's like, it's super quick. So um, if this, this was like, this is like a, a year and a half ago. So I was working on, um, 
It was right, right, right after McDonald's launched their um, that their like world famous app. You know the where you can basically you know you can order, you can order before you go. Yeah, wait curbside, pick it up, so on and so forth. So the app is just like a treasure trove of data, right? Yeah, sure. They they can tell, you know, what you're eating, what you're ordering. But if you step back almost like that um, Eames power of 10, you can look at the whole map of the United States and say, what what are people ordering in Washington? What are people ordering? So um, we had a remit to create sort of a, um, a year in review of the data from from that app. And that app went from like zero, you know, followers or people that had downloaded it to like 20 million in like six months. It was insane. Holy. And so um, I was working with, uh, I was working with the art director. Um, I'll mention his name because he'll like this. His name, <laughs> is, my, his, his name is Michael Lee. And, um, you know, we, our, our remit was actually not huge, but it was cool. So we be, what we did was we came up with this idea of a fanual report. It was sort of like taking this sort of stodgy, but I guess over like in time, like annual reports were really cool in the design world for a while sure. before they then sort of died off. But we sort of took this fanual report, married it with sort of like a yearbook type thing. And we looked at the data and we created this huge poster. I mean, I think it was like 17 by 24, 24 by 36. He he is like a super talented um, uh, graphic designer, but also illustrator. And he he was um, at, at the at an agency, and um, I was I was a contractor um, that they had hired me to run um, this project for McDonald's, and so. We're like, what if we build this visual world? Uh, McDonald's had this illustrative style that was actually, I think, um, designed by Buck, the the company that does a lot. They do a lot of illustration and animation. Yeah. So we took all the data and we created basically this visual illustration of the data. Oh, I love it. Um, there was like a, a Michael loves VW buses. So there's like a VW bus kind of uh, generically going through the drive through that was in grimace color. <laughs> you know, and there was some sort of like coins to denote um, the rewards that you get for using the app. There were some of the old school classic McDonald's characters hiding, wow. you know, um, fry guys. Cause, and... Yeah, fry guy hiding because <laughs> um, nostalgia is a huge, and diving into the culture of McDonald's. And um, and then we made versions. We made like twenty four versions of the poster. So so like fans. Uh, like influencer fans of the brand received the poster. And then it would also might have like a tweet that they had tweeted about their like what? love of something. And then it had breakdown data of um, like fry, like fries are the most uh, chosen item in this state or whatever. So it was like the, it was, you can Google it. It was like the, I think it was the 2022 McDonald's annual report. And it was like this just vision. Oh it could have been, it literally could have been a word cloud and I'm sure it would have been fine. Uh, right. It could have been, you know, this is so much it, better. It could have been vanilla, but it was in living color. And, um, I just remember, I think sometimes you get a brief and you can, some, there's an instinct to sort of like close your box to really small. Sure. And, um, I think the rebels start from sort of an infinite ground, right? And they they actually start at the edges. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! There's, yeah, yeah. Oh, my, okay. Well, I'm gonna put all the links to the stuff in the show okay, notes yeah. because I I'm gonna Google this right now as soon as yeah. We're I'll done. I'll send you a link to you so you can so you can see it. But um, oh, that's outstanding. Yeah. Lou, thank you so much for spending so much time with me and sharing your story. This has been an absolute treasure trove. Uh, awesome. Thanks thank for you. having me. And, uh, you know, I don't quite fly the pirate flag outside here, but like it's in my heart <laughs> and, and my mind. And um, and uh, it's definitely on my Instagram. I have the little pirate flag. And I, th I think you can 
you can be a responsible but brave pirate today. You know, whether you're operating in a in a um, in different environments from more risk taking to more conservative, I think if you care about the work, if you're, I think if you are a good collaborator and care for the people you work with, um, you know. Put the medicine in the candy. Don't put the candy in the medicine. <laughs> so. I love it. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, thank you. I've been your host, Michael Dargy, and this has been the Rebel Rebel Podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. And hey, if you're a rebel or you know a rebel, why don't you head on over to the Rebel Rebel Podcast.com and fill out our guest request form. We'll get back to you within 24 hours and maybe we can share your story with the world. Don't forget to like, share, or subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And thanks so much for listening. Until next time.